Tensor myography, uh, I don't know if you heard about it or not. It's, um, it's actually, it's a, it's a measuring method uh, which will give you information about the uh, skeletal muscle contractile properties. So um, it's not here to replace any of uh, other existing methods that uh, are already used. Um, so you have isokinetic devices, you have EMG, um, you have different um, tests uh, that will also give you information about how your muscles work. Um, but as you will see from the results, uh, tensor myography will give you, you know, one additional information which is quite unique uh, to this method. So um, to simplify everything, it will give you information about the speed of muscle contraction. Um, so not how fast that the person moves, but uh, actually how is isolated muscle, how fast can it contract. So uh, this is one part of the information which we think it's uh, the most valuable one. And the second uh, information that you get, you get information about muscle tonus or muscle stiffness. So um, what is the tension in the muscle uh, that you're measuring? Um, the method is uh, used so far in three different areas. Um, so maybe the first area that was the one that accepted the TMG was the sport. Um, in sport, tensor myography is used predominantly for um, improving performance um, and preventing injuries. So how do you do that? So as you will see, the measurement is um, quite easy and fast to, to perform. So what you try to do uh, when, you are, when you get an athlete to evaluate, you try to, to build up a muscle profile. That means that you will take all the muscles that are the most important in the sport in which this subject is active in. Um, in most cases, um, that means that you will probably measure around 10 muscle pairs. Um, that's uh, for the sports that, um, in which predominantly lower extremities are used. If you have a sport like swimming, um, of course, a lot, a lot more muscles are involved, so probably it will take a little bit longer to perform the measurement. But in most cases, um, for the basic measurement, it takes about 20, 20 minutes to get the evaluation. So it takes about a minute per muscle. And uh, with that, with this basic profile that you get, what you will see, you can, um, as a result, you can see that um, where do you have um, a certain deficit that you can work on to improve the performance. So you can use it to fine tune the training program of an athlete. Um, or on the other side, if you see a potential uh, danger, so if one of the muscles is uh, not at the, at the same level that uh, the other muscles are, um, you can detect a potential risk of certain problems, maybe even an injury that will be developed. So with this information, you can do something about it and uh, uh, reduce the chance for an injury to occur. Um, the frequency of these measurements um, depends on the nature of the sport. In most cases, our users uh, they do this basic screening four, maybe five times per year. Some they do it one time per year. And some of the users, they also want to focus not on all of the muscles which are important, but they focus on maybe one muscle or a small group of muscles which are the most important in a certain sport. And then they follow it more frequently. So in some cases, even weekly. So if you focus only on one muscle, one muscle pair, it will just take you a couple of minutes each week uh, per subject to, to see if there are any sudden changes in the muscle behavior that can you know, alert you um, and to, to further investigate why this change actually uh, occurred. Um, so when an injury occurs, you can use the TMG to monitor um, the rehabilitation process. So on one hand, it can also be used as a diagnostic tool. Um, sometimes our users, they use it to complement the imaging methods. So with imaging methods like ultrasound and MRI, you will get information about the structural damage uh, on the muscle. But uh, with the TMG and similar tests, uh, you will see what is the functional damage to the muscle. And as it was often shown, 
um, there is a time window uh, where when you do the imaging methods, uh, you will get uh, the results that will show no longer, that the muscle is no longer injured. So the muscle tissue is no longer damaged, but the function is far from being normal. And in these time windows, in most cases, the re-injuries in professional sports occur. So you can complement um, these imaging methods. In the early stages of injury, of course, imaging methods are much more valuable, but at the later stage, especially right at the end when you have to return, uh, when you have to decide if, this, if the subject, if, if the athlete is able to return back to, to maximum training load and back to competition, um, the methods like tensor myography prove to be much, much more valuable. So for return to play decision, um, I would say at the end of rehabilitation process, the TMG, as you will see, can be quite useful. I will try to also show you a couple of examples about that. Um, so of course, um, when you have an injured subject, then uh, the frequency of measurements will in increase. So it depends on the grade of an injury, first on the type of an injury and the grade of an injury. Um, usually in the beginning uh, you measure once, maybe once per week, but closer you come to the end of rehabilitation process, uh, the more frequent the, the measurements are. Um, some people, some users, they do it on daily basis um, right at the end of, of rehabilitation process. Uh, but of course, the number of muscles measured will be drastically reduced. You won't measure 20 muscles. You will maybe focus only on one pair. For example, if you have a hamstring injury, you will probably be just, you'll just take, you know, let's say biceps femoris muscle, left and right side, and that's it. Um, so it's quite quick to, to get uh, the data that you need to decide if the muscle is back to its maximum capacity or not. Um, so that means that frequency will increase, time needed for per measurement will decrease drastically. Um, it can also be used for getting a feedback uh, if the rehabilitation process is going in the right direction or not. Sometimes you don't have, uh, you know, you have a more complex injury, so maybe you have an ACL, surgery, so the muscles are not the ones that are directly affected by an injury, but uh, of course they are affected by inactivity that follows the surgery. And it is also frequently used to monitor rehabilitation after the ACL. And again, to fine tune rehabilitation process a little bit more, because with this you will see which muscle exactly needs maybe a little bit more attention during rehabilitation than the others. Uh, because it all depends on where the graft was taken. Of course, it also depends on the, on the subject uh, because almost every subject has a you know, different curve of getting back from, from, a, from a surgery um, back into the, com to the maximum uh, performance. So that would be the second area. The third one is uh, research. Um, there was a lot of research done already using the TMG. First articles were published almost 20 years ago. Um, these articles were mainly validation articles, so the TMG was compared to some existing methods that already looked into the muscle contractal properties. Um, for example, um, TMG was compared to the actual muscle composition. Um, muscle samples were taken and the TMG tests were performed. And it was shown that there is a very high correlation between actual ratio between slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers and one of the TMG parameters. I will tell you later which one. Um, but lately, most of the articles are, you know, um, Last year, I think, uh, 16 or 17 articles were published, which are more or less based on how a certain treatment affects the, the muscle properties, how a certain warm-up process um, affects uh, the muscle properties, um, how a certain training program affects muscle properties. So it's more or less practical 
applications of the TMG, either in rehabilitation uh, or just for the performance, training for the performance um, athletes. Um, if you are interested in, in any of the scientific publications, we'll be happy to provide you with the list. Um, and later on with the specific article if you want to, to read it. So um, when we finish, you can just, uh, you know, uh, tell me, give me your details, the contact details, and we will provide you with that. Okay, let's see how the tensiomyography actually works. Uh, it's a very easy um, method, actually, as you will see. Um, the measurement is always, so it's not a performance test where the athlete has to be active. Uh, the athlete is always measured in a controlled environment. So we are using the standardized positions in which the subjects are um, during the measurement. Um, also, the measurement protocol is always the same, as you will see. Um, so in this display here, the biceps brachii muscle is being measured. So in order to have standardized and repeatable conditions, the electrical stimulation is used to evoke the muscle contraction. So it's not um, a screening of the muscle activity during the voluntary movement. Uh, what you do is you use one millisecond long uh, impulse to evoke muscle twitch. And with the displacement sensor, which is placed on the muscle belly, you monitor the response of the muscle. So you will monitor this twitch that actually occurs because of the electrical stimulation. Um, maybe to show you, it's not the best display, but you will get the general idea how the measurement, one measurement looks like. Again, this will be the biceps brachii muscle. It's not in perfect setting, but like I said, just to get the idea how the measurement looks like. So just single twitch and the, the setup, usually when you're doing the measurement, let's say the full body scan will look like this. So in order uh, to get um, the best conditions, of course, the massage table is re required. Uh, the subject is, in this, in this case, we are measuring the rectus femoris muscle. Um, support pads are used to ensure always the same joint angles when you do the measurements because, of course, the length of the muscle will influence the muscle property. So all of these conditions has to be... Um, Every time you do the measurement, they have to be the same. This displacement sensor, of course, it's not held with your hand. We are using the, you can see there, it's a standard camera tripod with a mechanical arm to hold the sensor in position. And that's it. You don't need this medical card, but uh, uh, this is all, everything you need to, to perform the measurement. Um, it is frequently used not only in laboratory settings. Um, you can use it, uh, you know, on the field. Uh, so if you go on the track, if you want to, to monitor how a certain muscle, how a certain activity will affect the muscle properties, you can take it uh, on the track. You can do the measurement immediately after the activity. You can take it to the gym. Um, so it's portable. Um, it's battery operated so you can use it everywhere. But like I said, the basic conditions, they have to be the same all the time. So, uh, but it's easily um, transported by, by one person. Uh, this is the display of, uh, let's see if you focus directly on the muscle, what is happening. So this is the display on how the sensor tip is placed on the muscle belly. So when the muscle contracts, the muscle fibers will stretch, they will contract, and they will push the sensor tip inside. So this is basically what we are measuring. And the result that we get is time displacement curve that looks like this. Um, of course, different muscles will have slightly different shapes of this, uh, these curves. But nevertheless, uh, 
um, always five parameters are followed. Uh, I will go one by one, but at the end I will also tell you which ones are the most uh, important to follow. So to start with the moment of stimulation at time zero to, to the beginning of muscle contraction, the TD or delay time is measured. Uh, so this is the time that the muscle needs to react to the muscle, to, to the electrical stimulation. Um, usually this parameter, if the muscle is healthy, if uh, it's not injured, if it's not fatigued, uh, this parameter will be very stable. Um, not only that, also if you compare different muscles within your body, if you compare different people, different genders, different age groups, you will find this parameter to be quite stable. So in most cases, if everything is okay, you will not put too much emphasis on, on delay time. But in, if you have a, a person who has problems with nerve, uh, that innervates a certain muscle, if the muscle is injured, or if it's extremely fatigued, then what you can expect, you can expect a, a prolongation in delay time. So the muscle will need a little bit longer to react to the stimuli. And of course, in that case, you will pay attention also to delay time. But again, if everything is okay, delay time will be very stable and uh, not a lot of attention will be placed on this parameter. The next one though, the contraction time, is the parameter that uh, monitors how long does the muscle need to reach peak contraction. So to reach peak power, uh, to say it in other words, um, this parameter is the one that I already mentioned. It has a very high correlation with actual muscle composition. So that means that the shorter the time that the muscle will need to reach peak contraction, more fast twitch fiber this muscle um, will have. So predominantly fast twitch fibers and vice versa. Um, so uh, this is one of the reasons why contraction time is very important. The second reason is um, it's very sensitive. So uh, unlike the delay time, the contraction time will change if the, if the properties of the muscle will change. So. Uh, what you can detect with the contraction time, you can detect potentiation that will occur after uh, activating the muscle, after warming up, for example. Um, it will detect muscle fatigue, uh, local muscle fatigue immediately after certain activity. Um, it will change drastically immediately after an injury. So if you have a muscle injury, th this contraction time will prolong it, again, it depends on the grade and it depends on um, how long after the injury you are doing the measurements. But within a couple of hours um, or one day, you can expect this. If you have a severe muscle injury, uh, the contraction time can prolong 100% or even more. So it's a drastic change. Um, so these are acute changes. But on the other hand, you can also monitor chronic changes. That means that you can monitor the effect of the training program that you have. So if you're doing the measurements today and again in two, two months, so let's say in the beginning of preparation period and at the end, um, you can see if the muscles actually became quicker or sometimes because of the fatigue that was built up during the preparation phase, they can also become slower. You can see how the properties are affected by different seasons in, in soccer, for example. Um, so it can be used also to monitor chronic changes to see if the training program that uh, you prescribed was effective or not, or if it went into the right direction or not. So this contraction time um, is one of the two parameters, that's why it's also highlighted here in red, that uh, are closely monitored. Um, when you get the results of the measurements. Um, then the next parameter that we followed, and it's measured from 50% of the maximum amplitude of muscle twitch to the 50% on the way down. It's called sustain time. Um, this parameter will actually tell you how long does the muscle stays contracted. Uh, so from the point of view, for example, from a very explosive sports, 
like sprinting in so in all sports in in where they do a lot of sprinting like football um you would wish not for the muscle to contract very fast but also to relax very fast because during the maximum sprint um some athletes can perform five strides in one second that means that uh, the muscles have to turn on and off very quickly in order to to not to interfere with each other so that the movement pattern is very smooth and efficient um but to be to to be clear um since we are using the superficial type of stimulation sometimes this sustained time will be affected also by neighboring or deeper muscles and uh, that's why this parameter is not as stable and it doesn't have uh, very strong correlations like tc um in research uh, as you will find out um so not for all of the muscles but for the muscles like for example maybe the most easy to to understand is the gastrocnemius muscle especially the lateral head um most of the athletes most of the people they have this muscle which is very thin so um it's impossible to avoid co-contraction from the soleus muscle which is uh, just beneath the gastrocnemius and what you will get in result you will get double peak of the signal and this sustained time will be affected obviously by co-contraction so in this case um of course as you will um, compare the results are not as stable as the other one probably also during the um presentation about uh, uh repeatability of the measurements this will be also pointed out so tc can be very stable whereas in sustained time not so much uh of course there are some there are some cases in which um you will have a clear difference between healthy and person with problems and uh, one of the best examples is when you're measuring people with lower back problems and when you're measuring the lower back muscle so the erector spinae muscle um with normal people you will see that the muscle will relax in a reasonable time that means that the whole cycle usually it's around 300 400 milliseconds uh with people that they have um acute problems with their lower back this sustained time can be prolonged up to 2 300% so up to 1 second so the muscle will contract and then really really slowly relax and um this will be an obvious sign that there is something wrong in that area um so maybe this is the best example that um will tell you that not to overlook this parameter for some muscles yes and some conditions yes but not for not for all of them um the same goes for the half relaxation time the tr so it, uh, this parameter monitors how fast then the muscle when it begins to relax how fast it relaxes um it's the same situation as the ts it will be affected by sometimes it will be affected by co-contraction so that's why it's not so um stable and that's why not so much emphasis is placed on this parameter so this four time parameters all together like i said the whole cycle it depends on the person on the muscle it will be somewhere from 3 to 400 500 milliseconds um the shorter the whole cycle the better if you're involved in a dynamic sport obviously um and these time parameters are you know are can be compared between different genders different athletes from different sports um and also different muscles obviously can be compared within your body to see which one which ones are faster and which ones are slower so you can try to uh, build up on your symmetry as much as you can uh the fifth parameter on the other hand uh displacement is measured in millimeters and this parameter will tell you what's the difference between relaxed and contracted muscles so it will tell you the amplitude of the movement of the muscle belly during the the contraction and this parameter um 
cannot be compared between different muscles because the, uh, the main factor which will influence the amplitude is obviously volume of the muscle that you're measuring and, and shape of the muscle. So if you're measuring the big muscle like gluteus, for example, uh, when the muscle contracts, it will produce a big movement of the muscle belly. If you're measuring a small muscle like tibialis anterior, for example, with very small um, diameter, you would expect some small movement. So to compare these two numbers wouldn't have um, much of sense. But uh, uh, the other factor which will influence this displacement is muscle tonus, muscle stiffness, muscle tension. And um, from that point of view, it shouldn't be, so the tension in the muscle shouldn't be too high and it shouldn't be too low, it should be optimal. And what is optimal, it's find out only when you have enough measurements from, so if you measure a certain subject, what you will do, you will always compare that subject to the same group of people. So for example, if you're measuring a soccer player which plays um, defense, you will compare that data to soccer player which played defense. and. Um, of course, you take the same gender and you take the same age group as well. Um, so in that case, you will, as a feedback, you will see if the muscle that you're measuring is hypotoned or hypertoned. So if the tonus is too high or too low. So this is when you compare the muscle to some external data, but it is much more important uh, to compare the muscles within your own body. So in order to have uh, let's say a physique which is um, prepared to take the maximum stress and be efficient in movement. Uh, you will also have to have the muscles which are very symmetric uh, within your own body. So um, when you are measuring a muscle, um, especially a muscle that will, let's say, go from pelvis like the biceps femoris, the rectus femoris, and you will see a big difference in amplitude um, that will tell you that you have a different tension between left and right side. Um, and with this information, what you have to do is you have to look at the big picture. You have to find the reason why, because uh, sometimes the people have some issues that they're not aware of. So you can have a, you know, the position of the pelvis, which is not optimal. It can be tilted, rotated. That will create different tension front and back. Um, so the hamstrings or the rectus femoris muscle can be under a different tension. This can affect maybe just performance. It can affect the movement pattern, um, but sometimes it can also lead to injury. And uh, this is just, you know, something that can help you uh, to get some more data from the other methods and uh, to look at uh, the subject from different perspectives to see if there's something that you can do to uh, get rid of the reason why this happened. And I will also tell you how you, know, you can work on the problem uh, with uh, a certain um, interventions that are usually recommended after the measurement. So um, like contraction time, displacement is also very sensitive. So within minutes, I can do something or the subject can do something that will influence that so it can give you the acute changes. Um, again, when you have some potentiation, the displacement will increase a little bit. Um, when you have a muscle fatigue, when the fast twitch muscle fibers will be too tired to participate in contraction, the displacement will drop. If you have an injury because of the um, inhibition after an injury, displacement will drop. So um, it, it it's very, very sensitive. And like I said already for the contraction time, displacement can also show you the chronic changes. So it can, it, it can tell you if the, the tonus of the muscle is changed because of the, you put too much stress on a certain muscle group uh, during the, the training program or not. So to, to sum up this, what will follow closely is contraction time and displacement. So, Everything that happens up to this moment here, it's very interesting. What happens after that, it's a little bit less. I won't say it's you know, completely unimportant, but it's a little bit less important than 
uh, the first part of the curve. So there are different combinations, of course, of the contraction times so and, and the displacement uh, that can occur because of the certain, certain reasons. So the perfect picture, what you're looking for, would be very short contraction time and optimal displacement. So if you have displacement which is too high, um, the muscle is too loose. If the dis displacement is too low, the muscle is too stiff. So like I said, when you have the increased activation, when you, when you did something to, to achieve potentiation in the muscle, uh, these two parameters will change. The contraction time will shorten a little bit and you, and you will have a little higher displacement. And I already described what is going on when the muscle is fatigued, when the muscle is not used for a prolonged uh, period of time, or when the muscle is injured. So what you don't want to see, if you go back a little bit, you don't want to see the shift down and right of the curve. So if that begins to happen, something is not right in the muscle. So this is one example that uh, maybe clearly demonstrates what happens uh, after an injury uh, with the muscle uh, response. I will just go quickly through these parameters. So this curve, the middle one, it's the response of the biceps femoris muscle of a sprinter, which is healthy, which was healthy. So immediately after an injury, I think it was the same day, this happened. So shift down and to the right. So the contraction time prolonged, so by 30% or so, and displacement decreased. So we are missing the first peak. Usually this first peak is produced by the fast, fast twitch muscle fibers. Um, so what you would like to see that you go after an injury, you go from here back to here as soon as possible. But of course, this never happens. Um, because of inactivity of an injured muscle, you will lose muscle tonus, you will lose stiffness. So uh, the muscle will go into this direction. So the displacement will begin to increase because the muscle will be more and more loose. Um, this shouldn't happen though, because this was two weeks of complete inactivity. Usually you don't do that if you're an athlete, but if this was the last race of the season, some people do that. It's not the wisest thing, but nevertheless. So, um, this happens when you don't do anything for a long period of time after an injury. Um, so sometimes you can't. Sometimes uh, because if you have a, an injury that requires a cast on the leg, you cannot move you know, the knee joint, for example. You cannot reach the muscle. So you could use the electrical stimulation to somehow maintain the muscle tonus. So if you don't do anything, this will happen. And, um, the worse things get, the longer it will take you to go to get back to the normal. So as you can see that this contraction time went from 20 to 30, that's 50% you know, increase within a few weeks after an injury. Um, and a big, big difference in displacement. So um, this is just to get an idea what you can expect. Like I said, this is an example um, this is the reason why I'm showing you this, because it's an extreme example. But on the smaller scale, this is exactly what will, what will happen after each injury. But uh, what you will have to do, what you will have to work on to go back from here to here as soon as you can. Um, these 10 muscles that are highlighted here are the ones that are the most frequently measured. So. As I said, we can, we can, since we are using the superficial um, electrical stimulation, um, we can reach all superficial muscles. So fortunately, uh, especially for the lower extremities, the most important muscles are on surface, so we can reach them and we can do the measurement. Um, if you're looking at the upper extremities, unfortunately, we cannot reach the rotator cuff muscles, which are quite important um, for some sports, especially after an injury. But uh, that's the common problem for all of the methods. The only thing you can do, you can do some, some uh, functional tests. You cannot directly reach the muscle and get the response uh, from the muscle, which is quite deep um, and buried under 
the other muscles. So um, just to, to quickly, I don't know if you can see probably because of the light, hopefully you can see that. I will go quickly through the muscles. On the front here, we are measuring the tibialis anterior muscle, which is uh, responsible for dorsal flexion of the ankle. On the back, we are measuring both heads of gastrocnemius, which, is, which are responsible for the plantar flexor, flexion of, of the ankle. So if you look at that ratio, it is also important. I will show you the ratios that we're looking at uh, in the next slide. Then around the knee joint, we are measuring all three superficial quadricep heads. We cannot reach the vastus intermedius because it's deep. Um, on the back, usually we focus on the biceps, bicep femoris muscle. Um, all, of course, also semitendinosis can be used, but from the performance point of view, for most sports, it's much less important. And also the ratio uh, in frequency of injuries between the biceps femoris and the semitendinosis, it's, I think, about 80%, 85% of injuries are the injuries of the biceps femoris muscle and uh, just about 15 or 20% of semitendinosis. Uh, then, of course, the glute, lower back, and on the inner thigh, we are measuring the adductor muscles. So these are the 10 pairs that we usually measure. Of course, like I said, if you are measuring swimmers, uh, you'll be probably interested also in, you know, pectoral muscles, back muscles, shoulder muscles. So everything which is on the surface can be measured. But just to get you the general idea, um, I don't know if you can see the numbers, hopefully you can. Uh, the contraction time can go somewhere from 20 up to 46. This is the range of, these are the average values which are taken from male subjects, around 10,000 different subjects from different sports and different age groups. Um, so the, the TC, the range of TC is quite big in this case. But if you would look the, the average value of sprinters, you would go that most of these numbers here will be sub-20. Um, if, you, if you would take the numbers from an average older sedentary person, most of these numbers would be in 30s or even 40s. So um, this number will actually give you the idea what, what this muscle is capable of. So if you want to be a top level sprinter, what you will have to have most of these numbers here, except the glutes, but most of the other numbers will have to be around 20 or even less. Um, so as you will see later on during the measurements, what you do with the result when you, when you do the measurement. First step um, is during the measurements the, is your or not your, the results of the subjects that you're measuring at the moment will be immediately compared to the reference values. So the first feedback is within seconds. You see if the muscle you're measuring is faster than the average of, of the sport, or if it's slower, if the tonus is too high or too low. This is the first information that you get. And uh, to be honest, it's just an interesting information. It's not useful yet. Um, so it's much more useful um, I will go back to this in a minute. It's much more useful when you begin to compare the muscles within your own body. So um, if you're, of course, you can get the raw data if you want to for statistical uh, evaluation. But as you will see, you're, you have a chance to get uh, five different reports which are automatically generated. And most of them, what will do for you, uh, they will calculate the symmetries of the muscles within the body because this is even much more important from not maybe from performance point of view but for sure from the injury prevention point of view that the muscles within your body work with each other not against each other so the lateral symmetry is the one which is very important so we always measure muscles in pairs we never measure one muscle we measure left and right uh, even if one is injured, you have the second one to compare it to, to see what is different in muscle function. Um, then the functional symmetries, which I already mentioned a little bit, of the antagonistic pairs. Um, so like in isokinetic, for example, you would compare the quadriceps to hamstring muscles. You would compare the gastrocnemius to tibialis anterior. Um, but in addition to that, you will also compare synergistic muscles um, because sometimes 
uh, when you have a person with a certain issue, to be more precise, the, the subjects that have problems with patellar ligament, um, usually they have a big difference between medial and lateral head, especially in speed of contraction. Um, in most cases, the medial one is much, much slower than the lateral one. So um, this is one of the symmetry which is automatically calculated. The second one is the symmetry between medial and lateral head of gastrocnemius. Uh, because again, subjects with Achilles tendon problem, pain, injury, usually have, so not always, but in most cases, they have, a, again, the same situation. Medial head will be much slower than the lateral one. So this is automatically uh, calculated, and you can use it as the report that can be shown to the coach, to the athlete, but you know, only if you choose to do so. Um, so as you will see during the measurement, this is the print screen from the software. This is one of the muscles. Um, you, you get a curve during the measurement. Uh, you already saw that curve, and all five parameters are displayed beneath here. You see two numbers there. One number is from the subject, the other one is from the reference group. So when you input the data in the software, you pick the gender, you pick the age group, and you pick the activity. So um, we try to have um, very sport-specific activities. So in the beginning, we only had soccer players, and we just threw every, everybody in the same in the same group, and uh, we found out later on that you know you have a, a different different muscle profile for for those who play forward to those who play defense or midfield, especially the goalkeepers. Of course, they're a completely different sport. So we try to be as specific as we can. Um, for most sports that are popular. In, in, let's say, in Europe, uh, we have a solid reference databases, not for all of them, um, but it, uh, the software allows you to build your own reference database easy, and you can use that uh, later on to compare your results to. So this is the first feedback, and when you finish with the measurement, you can choose to generate one of the five reports, and the sixth one, as I said, it's, it's raw data. You can export raw data either in um, Excel, uh, so you can use it to, to throw the data around a little bit, or you can export it in TXT, so if you want to use it in, in other softwares which are um, intended to, to do some statistical analysis later on. So why we have so much different reports, it depends on um, how detailed information you want to get. So. Um, sometimes you want to get into detail and you also want to go into detail with, with coach. Um, maybe sometimes even with athletes, but uh, some of the users, they said, okay, we don't want to have too many um, information. Um, read, so the athlete shouldn't get too much information because they will get confused. Sometimes they don't even know which muscle is where and what is the function of the muscle. So sometimes you just simplify everything and you get one page in which you just get the general um, recommendations, what you should do. Then if you want to monitor changes in time, you can design the trend report to see how a certain parameter would change within a week, within a month, uh, within a year. Um, if you measure the whole team, the whole soccer team, 30 players. Usually the coaches, they don't want to get 30 different reports. Some do, some don't. Uh, so you can generate the team report, which is one file, with just the basic information about each individual and maybe some perspective on the whole team. And the last one is a single muscle report, which is usually used just for return to play decision. You just look at the one muscle which is injured, and look at the property of that muscle and see if it's normal. Then you say, okay, go. If it's still not back to where it should be, you get a red light and the answer is no go. So I'll just quickly show you these five reports. The individual report is quite detailed. So um, 
The first page is just a general text which will explain the user, you know, what, what type of stipulation, stimulation was used. Then the parameters are displayed like this. Then in the first part, you get a lot of numbers. So what you have here, it's the list of all, all the muscles that were measured. In this case, we have 10 muscle pairs. So the adducts are longus left, right, biceps femoris left, right, and so on. You have all five parameters that I described. And at the end, you have symmetry between left and right side. So obviously, what you're looking for, it's 100% symmetry, which, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to reach. But, uh, you know, somehow we made, uh, we made a line at 80%. Uh, so if there, if there is more than 20% difference between left and right side, the software will automatically give out a warning, can give you recommendation what you should do to decrease this difference between left and right. Um, so, but to be honest, everything above 90%, if you're looking about the professional athlete, this is something that you should aim for. Even if you have 80 something, uh, like in this case, 85, um, the software won't, let's say, complain, but, uh, you know, a coach, uh, so the add, the additional value of the person looking at the, the results and doing the interpretation, additional interpretation is also to mention that. So, you know, it's very simple. You're not in critical situation, but you could be better. So it wouldn't hurt and it doesn't take a lot of energy and time to work on this and try to build up as high symmetry as you can. So in this case, all the symmetries are high enough. So you can see that because none of the numbers here is, is, is highlighted in red. Because if you look at down here, I hope you can, you can see this. So these two numbers are red, these two numbers are red, these two numbers are red. So here we have these functional symmetries that I was talking about. So when you have a red color here, you later on you will have a warning that is given out and recommendation what you should do. So um, this is the same thing again, the lateral and functional symmetry, but easier to read. So here you have all 10 muscle pairs and the green area is the area of good symmetry. So the closer you are to 100%, the better. The further away you are from the center, um, worse, the worse the symmetry is. In this case, all the lateral symmetries are within the green area. For the functional symmetries, the same thing, but we can see that right knee is outside, uh, right and left Achilles tendon is outside. So some of the functional symmetries are a little bit lower as they uh, should be. So the next thing that you can d see here is comparison of contraction time to the reference values. So again, you have all the muscles written here. Green area, again, it's 100% and faster. So the muscles which are faster than the average, up to 20% slower than the average, you have a yellow area, which is considered still okay. So it's, uh, it's still adequate, but it, it could be faster. And everything which is outside that area, the software again will tell you this muscle is too slow, you should do something about that. The same goes for the displacement or the muscle tonus. So this would be the area of optimal tonus. The muscles on the inside are too stiff the muscles on the outside are too loose. So you will get, again, recommendation. Your muscle is too stiff, stretch, relax. Um, if the muscle is too loose, the recommendation would be try to tone up that particular muscle. So then the next step is very detailed comparison between left and right for each muscle, the curve. Vertical line represents reference values. These dots, again, represent the value of this person. And again, you can go um, muscle by muscle, parameter by parameter. But usually, um, like I said, if you're talking to, to an athlete, this would be um, maybe a little bit too detailed information. When you come to the next part, this one maybe is the most useful point of view. So um, all the muscles that were measured are written here. The ones which are highlighted with a certain color, 
um, they have something to work on. So if the muscle was too slow, um, activation exercises are recommended and the muscle will be colored in red. So if the muscle is too stiff, it's a light blue color, you need to stretch or relax. Or if the muscle is too loose, you have a violet color and you need to tone up the muscle, you need to do strength exercises. So you have a front and back view and beneath that you have text. So everything that was in numbers before and in these recommendations, you have the text here. So if everything is okay, just one sentence, you know, symmetry is good, nothing special about the speed of contraction, nothing special about muscle tonus, that's it. If you have something that should be worked on, you have the problem described here and then recommendation is written in bold and this is the end of this individual report. So, like I said, it's not for everybody. If you want to have very short and simple, it's just one page. I will try to minimize it so you can see a little bit more. So it's a one page. This is everything that you get. So you have the interventions and, you know, quick overview on what, should, what could be the reason. So if everything is within here, so none of the reasons so none of the interventions is because of the lateral symmetry. There are a few because of the functional symmetry and there are a few because of the tonus of the muscle is not right. Trend report, I think this one is the, the simplest to, to understand and this is something that will maybe help you understand uh, why I said that TD is very stable. So here you can see that this is delay time of the vastus medialis muscle. Uh, this is a football player um, with almost two and a half years of the measurements apart. So uh, February of 2012 and the last one is end of May 2014. So you can see that delay time left and right, the symmetry is very high and it doesn't change almost at all within two and a half years. Um, if you look at the contraction times, you can see in the beginning there were some changes, but for the last year and a half, no change whatsoever. And when you look at the tonus, at the displacement, you can see that it is a little bit more sensitive because the properties of the muscle from the um, speed of the contraction point of view, they don't change that much during the season, but the tonus can sometimes change quite obviously. So uh, after a person of, uh, person, after a, a period of, uh, let's say, uh, a little bit heavier activity, the tonus will usually be a little bit higher and vice versa. After the season, when you relax for a couple of weeks, the tonus will be much, much lower than it used to be before that. So in this case, you can see that the only thing that is interesting here is um, the constant difference between left and right vastus medialis muscle. This person uses predominantly right leg for kicking. He has a little bit higher tonus in that particular muscle. This is usually not the case, but it's, a, it's a something that is um, true for him. He tried to work on that, but uh, you know, usually it's uh, something that it's, uh, uh, it can be a consequence of something that cannot be influenced directly by the training. Um, sometimes you could have some past injuries that will leave you some difference between left and right side forever, no matter what, what you do about it. So, um, but you have to understand that because if you want, if you try to um, work on an issue that you discovered um, without trying to understand why this difference actually occurred, uh, you're not doing a really good job. So you really need to take, take one step or two steps back to see what is the reason for these differences uh, between left and right, front and back, and try to work on that first, and then do some interventions that can lead to, to improved performance. Okay, couple of more reports and I think and that will be it. So the team report 
In this case, we just made some examples. So these are the players, height and weight. This is for statistical reasons. Um, of course, this is the list of the muscles measured. Then you have the comparison of the average of the team, in this, time, in this case contraction times, to the reference values. So you can see in this case only the glutes are a little bit slower than the average. All the other muscles are more or less faster than the average of the sport. So from the team point of view, you can say, okay, maybe we should more work a little bit more on glutes. Then you do the same thing for the, the muscle tonus. Then you go person by person and just get the general information of what had to be done, what has to be done for that person. In this case, you can see not much. And at the end, this is maybe the easiest way to overview the results, is just a display like this. So in this case, what you can see is gastrocnemius medialis muscle has a lot of issues, and rectus femoris muscle has a lot of issues. Most of the other muscles are not so very problematic. So from the team perspective, you can say, okay, maybe we should look into this and try to, to see the reason why this happens. And if you look horizontally, you can say, okay, this player doesn't have any issues. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six. So you can say, okay, again, what is the reason for that? Can we do something about that? So that's the team report. And the last one, it's just a single muscle report. Um, this is the result of a sprinter after hamstring injury. So you take uh, left and right, so you take healthy and injured, you compare TC to the reference values and the, the left one is faster than the average, the right one is slower than the average, the right one is actually the injured one. And if you look at the tonus again, the tonus on both is so-so, it's, it's good, but this speed here is much, much slower than it should be. So when you look at the speed symmetry between left and right, it's 73, which is lower than it should be, so you have a red color, and the uh, decision that would be taken in this case would be wait a little bit longer. We still have to work on the muscle. When we get higher than 80 at least, then you can say, okay, you have a green light. So, and this is the fifth report that can be automatically generated. So, it's all up to you. Um, like I said, um, sometimes the users, they prefer to use these reports. Um, sometimes they just take raw data because it's very seldom that you only do the TMG test. Because if you have a pre-season screening, you do 10 different tests, for example, uh, and uh, you have a different, a lot of different reports and you have to take everything into one, one text of recommendations so you don't give an athlete or coach um, so many different reports. So, like I said, it's all up to the users. Um, so I think that for this part, uh, I, would, I would finish now. So later on, when we do the practical test, um, maybe I can show you a couple of examples, what can be expected after an injury to, to show you, you know, health and injured one. Um, but for now, I think that uh, I gave enough information. So if there are any questions regarding this so far? <coughs> Nothing? Okay. Good sign, good sign or bad sign, I don't know. Um, if it's on if it's on surface and if it if you can reach it then it can be so the thing is um, sometimes you have to modify the measuring uh, protocol a little bit by trying to isolate small muscles because if you ha if you have a big muscle it's not a problem you know usually we are using the standard 50 by 50 millimeters electrodes. Uh, what you don't want to, to get, you don't want to get uh, contraction from more than one muscle at the time because the signal will then be the, the mixed signal of more muscles than one. So if you're measuring small muscles, you either use the small electrodes, uh, you can also cut you know, the existing ones into smaller area, 
And if, if the muscle is big enough, so if the, if the area which is on the surface is big enough to place two electrodes and the sensor tip, then you can do the measurement. So infraspinatus sometimes can be measured. So because a small part of the muscle is there, but uh, supraspinatus cannot be measured. This is just an example.